Okay, we're going to go to James, the book of James today. James, I think, uh, chapter 3. Sorry, chapter 4. I always think it's in 3, but it's always in 4. It hasn't moved yet anyway. James chapter 4, you're going to start at verse 1. It says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? And I'm reading out of the NIV version. You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have, because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. That doesn't just necessarily, we've talked about, that doesn't necessarily mean money. It can mean anything you ask from God. You know, a lot of times we ask for healing so that we can spend it on our pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? And enmity simply means to be hostile against or to have hatred for. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. I kind of like the way the New King James says it makes himself an enemy of God. I'm just going to stop right there and... We were listening to a message uh, about 10 days ago on a Wednesday night talking about cultures. And, and we were listening to different, uh, how cultures coll- clashed or collided. And, and we're talking about head, you know, head wrappings and, and being a woman as a disciple and sitting at the feet of Jesus. And, and I, as I was sitting there listening to it, I began to think, and I, it just began to hit me, and, and I, it just hit me, and, and I, was, I was listening, it just kept getting stronger and stronger in me, is that we actually have, in the gospel of the kingdom, the greatest culture clash of all, and that is, we're trying to end the whole culture. I mean, the head wrapping, all of these other things are, are just minor cultural clashes, and, I, and they do make a big deal with people, but they make a big deal with people because we love the world so much. And we're trying to end this present age. That's really what the gospel is about, is about ending this life. Now think about that a minute. Because it makes, look, it makes it really difficult to get people into the real gospel, the real kingdom of God, because we're trying to end this life, and we love this life. Notice what it said, what we read, is that, and the, the Bible says this, I didn't read it, I didn't write it, I mean I read it, but I didn't write it. It says whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes for himself an enemy of God, and it talks about you war and you fight because you can't get what you want, you want to spend it on your pleasures. That means anybody who quarrels and fights hates God. Just let you think about that a minute. I, the Bible said it, I didn't. Because it says, where do wars and fights come from? It says, from your members that desire pleasure. So if you're fighting, if you're warring against God, and which means, what? He's gonna be, you're gonna, the people are going to be warring against people, right? Because that's how God manifests himself in the earth, is through people. That's the biblical pattern, is it not? The biblical pattern is, the people who hated God always killed God's people. They always claim to love God. The religious group always claims to love God. But then when God manifests through people, they try to kill it. So anytime anybody wars and fights against you when you're trying to bring forth the kingdom, it's because they have hostility and hatred towards God. I'm sorry, that's the way it is. I know you, some of you probably have some loved ones that fight against you, but that's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with people who hate and have a hostility towards God. Because this church, the spirit that we have in this church, is a spirit that wants to do away with the world system. And you've got to realize, we're dealing with people, and most of the church people, we're dealing with people that want to keep this system alive. They love this system. They don't like the consequences of this system. 
And if you look at most church services, and, most, and when I'm ta- talking church services, I'm talking about our charismatic, word of faith church services, they're always trying to make the consequences better, but keep the world involved. You need some discernment, but if you listen to their music, listen to their preaching, listen to their prayers, you're going to find out what they're really trying to do is use the kingdom of God, use the gospel to fix the consequences of the world, but not do away with the world. They're not trying to do away with it, they're trying to make it better. So we can enjoy it, so that we can spend it on our pleasures. (laughs) And we're trying to end this present system. And, and some of you wonder why it is. I know some of you have said things. Did you have something? Oh, I was just going like that, okay. <laughs> yeah, and now, now I, there's, gotta be, there's a couple of things I've got to say here. First of all, you know, the Bible does say God gives us all things richly to enjoy, all right? So people are going to think, oh, what, you just hate everything. Well, in comparison to wanting to end this age, that's what it'll look like. Remember when, it's the same principle when Jesus said, unless you hate your father, your mother, your brother, your sisters, and even your own life. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean we run around hating everybody? No, it just means that your love for him is so much greater that it makes it look like you hate your family and your own life. So we enjoy these things, but in comparison to ending it, there should be no comparison. We want to end this present age. I mean, we're glad for the things that God has given us here. I'm glad for the things that I get to enjoy. But we want to try to end this present age. And you've got to ask yourself this question. I know some of you have said this before. You've said, well, I don't understand why people don't want the kingdom of God. Look, let's change it and look at it from this perspective. How many people do you think want to end this present age? That's why they don't like the kingdom of God. That's why they don't want this. The spirit of our church here is, and people walk in, you may not preach it to them, you may not say it directly, but that spirit is here of we're trying to end this thing. We're trying to get this thing ended. And get the kingdom of God, get, you know, the, the righteousness, the reign of Christ in the earth, that, a new heaven and a new earth, yeah. that's what we're trying to get. And you're dealing with people when they, you know, I think about when we had the youth there for a while. Ask yourself, how many high school students, how many junior high, how many, what do they call sixth grade now? Is that middle school? Or, how many middle school want to end this present age? You're going to have a difficult time. They don't want to end this present age. They want to go to prom. They want their homecoming. They want the next ball game, the next party, the next dance. The boyfriend, the girlfriend. People, young people want kids. They want to see their grandkids. They want to get married. They want to have a husband and a wife. They want to go to Europe. They want to see the Eiffel Tower. They want to do their hobbies. You know, everybody has a goal in this life. And it's very difficult to get people switched over into ending all of that. You know, listen, you can still go for your goal, but your desire and push to get this kingdom in and end it should be so much greater, it looks like you hate your goal. And, so, and that's why the people uh, in Jesus' time, throughout the Old Testament, in Jesus' time, and through the Gospels, and, and through the book of Acts, and, and during the times of the disciples and the apostles, that's why they were always killed. Is because nobody, and that's why the devil puts, you know, puts uh, all this uh, false doctrine in, is because, and people love it, they'll love the false doctrine, they'll go for it. Why? Because they want this present age to stay here. And so we've done everything in the church we possibly can to try to figure out how can we keep the world and love it and do away with the consequences of it. Look at all your altar calls. Every time people run for, what are they, they're trying to get the consequences dealt with of, from loving the world. They're not trying to end the world. They're not up there praying, saying, God, what can I do to bring this thing to an end? What, how many altar calls do you see where people go forward and say, what can I do, God? Because it says in here to hasten the coming day, doesn't it? What can I do, God, to hasten the coming day? That's what my prayer is. That's what I want to be prayed for. What are, we dealing, what are most prayers dealing with? 
Consequences. Consequences. And look, I understand that when somebody comes into this and they're brand new into this, I understand dealing with consequences. And Jesus dealt with consequences, didn't he? But he dealt with consequences to demonstrate who he was. It was never supposed to be a lifestyle. And that's what we've turned it into. We've turned it into a lifestyle. We've turned it into a whole religion of Jesus came here so that we can fix consequences every week in our life. That's basically, if you look at it, Overall, that's basically what's going on. The Bible says, if we go back and read Daniel, it says, it talks about uh, the stone. Are you familiar with the story, those on the internet? If you go back and read Daniel, you know, I, I think it was uh, Nebuchadnezzar had a vision, and he had a vision of a giant statue with a head of gold, a chest and arms of silver, the, the waist of bronze, the legs of iron, and the feet of iron and clay. And as, and as Nebuchadnezzar was dreaming, he says, I watched and a stone was cut out without hands. And of course, we know who that is. That's Jesus. And came and it struck the image on the feet and broke the, the iron and the clay that was mixed. <laughs> mixed. <laughs> and broke it and the image fell. And I think it was either, either Nebuchadnezzar or Daniel, I can't remember. I think it was Nebuchadnezzar said, said, this kingdom, or maybe it was Daniel, when he was interpreting the dream, he said, this kingdom, the kingdom of the stone that was cut out with that hand, will destroy all other kingdoms. And you've got a whole lot of people in church that don't want a lot of the kingdoms destroyed. They really kind of like them. And everybody's going to tell you with their mouth, oh yeah, we want Jesus to come, oh yes, we want these, this world to be ended. But you'll find out real quick when you start preaching the truth to them and you start moving into a kingdom that actually has the ability to end this present age, you'll find that become, they start to become hostile. <laughs> We've dealt with them, huh, Kathy? They become really hostile while at the same time saying they want this present age to end. But they won't do anything to try to end it. What? <clears throat> yeah. What, the destroyed? No. Oh, well, I'm going to explain I would, that. I would like you kind of to explain, especially for the Internet people that when you say in this present age, you're not meaning we die and go to heaven. You mean in the present age of the rule of the enemy right. in the king. Would you kind of explain that a little bit? When we talk about the to end this present uh, world or this world system, of course, th this is our belief here in Revelation Light, and we believe this is what the Bible teaches because it does. And I'm sorry if you disagree, you're wrong. Well, that's just the way it is. Sorry, but, uh, it, you, you know, I never have anybody... T they always tell me I'm wrong, and I always say, just give me Scripture, and they just look at me like a post. They can't give me anything. And the Bible says that, that uh, you know, that Jesus came, He gave us salvation, He gave us, uh, which is, what? Health, safety, rescue in this life. Health, safety, rescue, prosperity, deliverance. A joy, I don't know, peace, soul peace in this life. And what we're trying to end is the present rulership of the system of the world that the devil now has. Remember when the devil said, took Jesus up to the high mountain and he, and he promised him all of the uh, kingdoms of this world? And he said, because what, what did the devil say? He said, all of these have been delivered into my hands. And if we go and read, well, let's just go read it. As long as Kathy asks that question, turn with me to Revelation. Because here it is. You, those on the Internet, you want Scripture? Here, here we go. And I know what you're going to say. Well, this is after we die. No, it isn't after we die, Goof, goofy. Well, the, you know, everybody wants to put everything in after we die. And if you read the Scripture, there's no way you're going to be able to read the New Testament without finding out that God tried to bring us to this while we're alive. Uh, chapter 11, Revelation. Revelation. 
Verse 15, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Now, as long as we're reading that, let's go to 2 Peter. And I'm going to read chapter 3, most of it. Beloved, I now... Well, dear friends, I'm going to read out of the NIV. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last day scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But that day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Now, you know, I can, uh, and Kathy just asked a good question, you know, explain what that is. And really, if you want to be wrong and you still want to believe that this is all after we die and that all of this destruction is physical destruction, you know, I really don't even want to argue that point. The point this morning is, are you working to get that end in sight? To speed it up? That's, all I'm, that's what this is all about. If you want to go ahead and believe that, that the, when it says the elements you know, melt with fervor and heat, if you want to believe that that's the earth and the rocks and it's just going to get so hot that everything turns molten, that's not what it means. But if you want to continue to believe that, go ahead. But the idea is, are you working to have that happen? Because the Bible says, looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. Because what we believe is those elements, if you look it up, it doesn't mean elements as in physical elements. It's the same word that Paul uses in Galatians where he says you, you are in bondage to the weak and beggarly elements of this world. So it's not talking about physical rocks and dirt and that, that the earth is going to melt under a nuclear holocaust or some, some thing as that. It's talking about that when the fire of the Holy Spirit comes in, it melts those beggarly elements that are in your life. And we have, a today say, we have a today belief on these particular scriptures is that you have a new heaven and a new earth. Those of you that find the kingdom of God, you see heavens differently. You see the earth differently. You're already starting to have a new heaven and a new earth. But we want the fullness of that new heaven and new earth coming. And that's what we're working towards. And when we have the fullness of the new heaven, when we have the fullness of the new earth, the old system will be done away with. Yeah. But see, so many people want to stay in this old system. They just want to deal with the consequences of this system. Heal me. Get me. I mean, how many times? See, here's a culture clash. How many churches, and you can watch any Christian TV, how many, how many messages are dealing with offering to get finances? We're trying to do away with finances. In the new system, you don't need finances. 
So while we need it now in this system, we're going to end, we're trying to end the system. But if you look at most of what's going on in church today, it's we're trying to strengthen the financial system. And why is that? I know why it is. Why? <laughs> because we want to finance all the projects that we have in church that aren't God-breathed. Uh, somebody said something, I don't remember if it was last Wednesday evening, and I, I, I think it was e Wednesday evening, and I was standing there, and I said, because I trust God. I'm talking, oh, we were talking about we were the hope, we were the hope of God. You know, we're all hanging our heads thinking, you know, oh, you know, we're so bad, we're so this and that. And, that's, and we are, but see, that's, that's we, we can look at ourselves that way, but you see, I trust in God's power. Whether it be me or somebody else, I trust in God's power. And if you go into the book of Ezra, you'll find out that in order to fulfill the word of Jeremiah, God moved upon the heart. Now think about, you know, we read these words and you don't realize the miracle and the power of God that, this, that took this, moved upon King Cyrus to let the people go and go rebuild the temple. That's a big deal, folks. So I've got, this is my belief, and listen, it doesn't take away from teaching on tithes and offerings and it doesn't, or giving of anything, but see, I trust that God will move upon the people to be givers. If God has a word to fulfill, has He given us words over this church? If He has a word to fulfill in this church, He will move in the hearts of the people to give in this church. So I don't have to hit you service after service after service after service. Because if he's got a word to fulfill, if those words were truly his, if they really came from him, he will provide it. Because that's the way I see that he works in here all the time. He provides. Where nobody, where it looks impossible. He moves upon, if the believers, and you'll say, well, yeah, but if he moves on the believers and they don't do it, then he moves on the unbelievers. And they'll do it. And they'll do it. And I trust God to move us into the... It, it, tell me, is this a trustworthy word? Yes. It is? Yes. You sure? So when he said it's a new heaven and a new earth, that's a word from the Lord, isn't it? That means that he's going to move on somebody's heart to fulfill that thing. Might as well be us. Yeah, that should be our prayer. And yet we look at what most people waste their prayers on, and this is what really gripes me, is what most people waste their prayers on is things that God said would already be added unto us if we would seek the kingdom. Do you notice that? He said, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things the Gentiles seek after will be added unto you. And if you watch in most of the like Christian TV, you're going to find that they're constantly asking for offerings. They're constantly, almost all the messages are dealing with things that the Gentiles are seeking after. And it's really bad because they use your love of the world to get you to give. Now, how do they do that? Because they promise you all of these returns, don't they? And you know, listen, everybody's out there saying, oh, it's for the kingdom of God. It's for the kingdom of God. But you know deep down in your heart that there's a little thought somewhere deep down in there that you want to spend it on your pleasures. Come on. Oh yeah, I want to give it to the kingdom of God. We've had, we had, we had people person tell us that one time they went and they got a really good job and it paid a lot of money and this is what this is what they counseled with they said well because it was going to take them out of church for quite a few services 
Oh, yeah, but I'd be able to give to the church and it'll be a financial blessing. How much did they give, Kathy? Five bucks? Yeah, five bucks. And they had the job for how long? Long time. Five bucks. All of creation thanks you for your generosity. <laughs> Dave Wilkerson said that one time. And I, that just was so funny. I laughed because somebody said gave a dollar into the plate or something. And all of gener creation thanks you for your generosity. You know, five bucks. They spent it all on their pleasures. So we're trying to end this present age. And it makes it very, very difficult sometimes for churches like ours to get people to see the value in ending this present age because they love it. They don't like the consequences of it, but they love the age. They love the world system. You know what I mean? They love the ball games. They love the, you know, uh, think, about, think about somebody wanting a, uh, a, a child or a boyfriend or a husband or a girlfriend more than they want the kingdom of God. But you'll find out that in, in real life situations and when you're preaching the real kingdom of God, you're going to find out real quick the division will come when the kingdom starts being preached. And they become hostile and they become warlike because they, they hate God. I don't care what they say with their mouth. That, that is so difficult for us to get... Uh, it's so difficult for us because we want to believe what people say with their mouth. You know what I mean? We want to believe that they, that they love God, and I've had a lot of people, oh, that they really love God. Really? What happens when God comes in conflict with their world system? Then you find out what they really love. And notice what it says. It says, if you love the world, and I like the way the King James says it, it may, you make yourself an enemy of God. That's how I always interpreted it. In other words, God doesn't make you his enemy. You make God your enemy. And so we've been trying to end this present age for I don't know how, you know, ever since, I guess probably just about ever since we took over. It's been in the back of our heads that let's get this thing over with. And that's one of the reasons so many things are so backwards in the church. If we look at the church system right now, let me ask you a question. If we look at the church system right now, which is easier to get, the young or the old? Huh? The young, isn't it? It's easier to get the young involved. Why? Because, we're still, because we still have the love of the world in the church. It should be easier to get the old. Because the older you get... The more you see how corrupt this system is, the more you want to end it. But see, we're losing the older people. Do you know why? We've talked about it in here before. It's because the, world, the, the church system is still based upon the love of the world. And after you get so old, the world doesn't appeal to you anymore. So there's no reason to attend church. As you get older you should become more excited about the things of the kingdom of God. You should, because you're watching. As you get older, you begin to... Uh, you should. <laughs> expand out beyond yourself. <laughs> right? I mean, how many... Young people, and I'll say, let's say below the age, from 18 below, are thinking of other people. Very few. That's all about them, right? Well, I, I'm giving the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> but let's face it. After you get 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, you at least, even without God, expand out beyond a little bit beyond yourself, don't you? Now, I know, without the kingdom of God as you get older, you start to revert back in. Yeah, quite a bit older. I'm 59, so it starts at 60. <laughs> no. 
And then when I'm 60, I'll start it at 61. <laughs> no. I mean, you know, when you get quite a bit older, you start to revert and you begin to think more about yourself. But see, with the kingdom of God, as you get older, it should become more and more exciting. Because you should see the coming day approaching. You should feel the coming day approaching inside of your heart. And don't tell me some of you haven't felt that. Don't tell me that there's times maybe, it may not, I'm not talking about all the time, but once in a while, all of a sudden, it's like, I hate to use this term because somebody used to use it all the time and I hated it, but you get hit by something. You, all of a sudden, it's like your eyes are opened just for a, a millisecond to the realness and the fullness of what God wants. And it, you almost go, you've experienced that? So as you get older, you should have more of those experiences. And when you see that, it should give you a fire and a... And a, a uh, that, I'll tell you what, that's my desire. I would love... Gosh, I would love to have a church of 90-year-olds that are jumping and dancing and, and are, are, are leading, not sitting back saying, well, I've done my part. Leading the charge... Would that be America? Would that be something that's never been seen before? Might as well be us. <laughs> if we were really teaching the truth, it should, and that's what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that it's the aged that are supposed to be the ones. Why is that not happening? Why is it all the youth? Why is it the young ones? And I'm not counting the young ones out. I'm, not cer I'm certainly not saying, well, let's forget about the young ones. That would be a miracle too. But what I'm saying is, is the Bible says that the aged are the ones that are supposed to be leading. Why is that not happening in the church? It's because we've still got the love of the world in it, and so we're gathering young and middle-aged, but the old are falling by the wayside. I'm telling you, folks, that's what causes the biggest culture clash of all is the real church is trying to end this present age. And you've got to even ask in your own heart, do I really want this present age ended? Do I want one more vacation before Jesus comes? Do I want to get married? Do I, whatever it is, you know, the bucket list. You've seen movies called the bucket list. Do I want to do those things before Jesus comes? And the answer should be no. I want you, I want to end this present age. What can I do, God, to end it? I know I can look forward to it, but you said I could speed it up. How, God, that's my prayer. How do I speed up and end this present age? I'm telling you, it's, uh, it's, that's where our real war is. And the real culture clash is when we're trying to do away with the whole culture. Not just little pieces of the culture, the whole culture. And it's usually too much for people to take. They say that's too weird, that's too out there. But if you read the scripture, that's why Jesus came. It said his kingdom would destroy all other kingdoms. He came, to, he came to make the kingdoms of this world. Now when we say destroy, again, you're going to think humanistic destruction. But we just read the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. So these kingdoms are going to be changed. That's how they get destroyed. We've discussed in this uh, uh, church before, you know, uh, you know, God killed Saul. Not King Saul, but the Saul uh, who became Paul. How did he kill him? He made him Paul. He made him Paul. And it changed him into a completely different person. <clears throat> yeah, he, he changed the kingdom of Saul into a kingdom of the Lord and of his Christ. That's what he did. And he took Paul's or Saul's exuberance to run around and persecute all the churches. What did he do? He changed that now to a guy who runs around and preaches the kingdom of God. 
He didn't kill him physically. That would be the devil's way of doing away with him. That's the devil's way of change, is to kill physically. God's way of destroying is to change a person. See what I mean? And that boy, you got you, when you get that in your heart, and and that glimpses you get those glimpses every once in a while like that, and it takes your breath away. And see, some of us we just can't hardly believe that God could do that to us. You got Paul as your example, folks. If he could do it to Paul, he can do it to anybody. You ain't near as bad as Paul. And that's how God changes us. How he destroys is he changes us into an, he makes a kingdom that was once used for the enemy into now a kingdom of the Lord and of his Christ. Some of you are good singers in here. I know Cassie's a good singer. We've got some good singers in here. And probably, I don't know, depending how, on how long you've been in the kingdom of God, but had you not been in it long, and you know people that have done this, you could have used those voices for the world. You could have been singing country western and about affairs and adultery and all of these kind of different things. I know, I'm sorry, country western. It's <laughs> rock and roll, hard rock, heavy metal. How's that? <laughs> well, God didn't destroy your voice. He changed it. So now you sing for the kingdom of God. That's the way it should work. And a lot of people flip back and forth sometimes, but that's the way that it should. So when you read that this kingdom will destroy all of the kingdoms, don't, get, don't think humanistically destroy. He destroys by changing. In fact, anytime you read, just give you a little hint out here for the internet viewers, anytime you read the Old Testament and it said God's going to destroy or God's going to kill or God's going to annihilate, whatever you read it, I want you to think about what I just said. I just want you to think about what I just said, is that God destroys by changing. He doesn't destroy by annihilation. That's the devil's way. That's how the devil, like I said, that's how the devil changes things, is he kills physically. God kills by changing. A new creation. Old things are passed away. How many things become new? Does that mean the kingdoms of this world? There you go. Very simple to understand, religion just fouls it up so bad and deceives us so wickedly and plays upon our humanistic concepts. That's why we can't believe what we're trying to believe for. It. Why it's so difficult to get people to believe in these things is because we walk so much by sight, so much by what religion has taught us, which is based upon what religion has seen. God destroys by changing. And that's how he'll make a new heaven and a new earth. He'll change it. So don't get the idea we're going to have be nuclearized or is that a word? Probably not. <laughs> but you know what I meant. Okay, even though it's not a word, you know what you know, it's not going to be a nuclear holocaust. It's not going to be uh you know, the sun expanding and melting the earth. God's going to change it. And that will destroy the old and bring in the new. And I tell people all the time, you want to be killed by God. Now, that's hard, boy. People hear that and they just want to cringe. Because they, yeah, because they think he's bad and they think he's the one that's doing all the physical killing. And, and isn't that amazing how the devil's managed to hide himself and get everybody to blame God for what he does. You want to be killed by God because the way you get killed by God is you get changed. And some of you have experienced some death in your life. That's, the Bible speaks about that. It talks about you died and your life is hidden with Christ. What do you mean I died? I'm still alive. What do you mean I died? He killed off and changed. He said we're buried with him in baptism. Right? All you have to do is read your Bible and re take off your religious glasses and read it for what it says and just, you know, go to the Bible and say, God, I want you to, you know, I've been taught this guy on the internet is just saying all of this far out stuff. And it just sounds like cultish. It sounds 
you know, way out there, like they're in really weirds land, and says, and, but this is what I believe, this is what I've been taught. I want to read your, this is all you have to do is, I'm going to read your Bible, I want you to open my eyes to the truth. But they won't, most of them won't do that. You know why? Because they love this world system and they don't want it to end. They might find the truth. So they won't do it. And they're going to feel hostility and hatred towards us. Oh yeah, some will bless us. Some are going to see. Some eyes are going to be open. People that are searching are going to know that what I'm saying is going to bear witness in their lives and some of you it's bearing witness in your lives as I sit here and I preach and you know that you've seen those things those uh, when that 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 when your eyes all of a sudden open and the kingdom of God is so real you know sometimes the kingdom of God seems so far away doesn't it but then other times when God it's almost like when Elisha what was it Elisha opened the eyes of his servant and he saw the chariots of fire that's almost what it's like it's almost like he, like you just said you can just reach out and step into it and be gone. You ever feel those times? And you almost become totally oblivious to what's going on in, in the realm, in the, you know, in the worldly realm, so to speak. And that's what we need to do is, is our desire is to end this present system. Hey, if God blesses you in your circumstance, if He takes some consequences out of your life, Man, I'm not going to thank you, Lord. I'm not saying, somebody's going to think, well, what, are you preaching against God coming and fixing consequences? Yeah. No, I'm preaching against when our attitude is, that's all we want Him for. Right. Yeah, or we deserve the change. In other words, I want Him to deal with my consequences, but kind of leave... kind of leave my world alone because I kind of like it there are certain things in my world that I like I like my ministry God I really don't want you messing with it I mean there's a multitude of things we can come up with that we love and I know we've talked about the eye of the needle and and, you know, the prophecy of the eye of the needle and laying everything aside. But, but in reality, how do we really feel in our heart? So we want to do away with this system. And that's the goal, really, of this church, is we're trying to end this present system. And that's going to cause a major culture clash major culture clash I mean just think how many people love their church services the way they are <laughs> don't want any change you know really you're this kind of now this may sound a little odd we're trying to do away with our church services <laughs> you say well, what do you mean You surely don't believe that our church services are perfect. <laughs> then they need to be done away with. <laughs> not when I say, now you got to hear the way I'm saying this. Those on the internet. I'm not saying, oh, well, we're going to quit coming to church. What I'm saying is, we're working towards something that is better that will end what we have now. That's what we're working for. But how many churches are doing that? How many churches are working for a, ser for a better service to end the service that they have now? Well, I don't think many of them are. That's what we're trying to end. So we're always against culture. We have a culture right now in our church. Did you know that? What's our culture? Huh? We have a type of culture right here in our church that we're trying to do away with. Every service, we try to grow 
and go higher, don't we? You're not trying to go lower, are you? No. You're trying to go higher. Well, if we go higher next week, that goes against the culture we had this week. So we're always on, against culture. You see what I'm saying? So let's try to end this thing. And when you ask the question, why don't people want this, answer it with, do they want to end this present system? And that will give you your answer as to why they don't really want this. Because they love this system. They look forward to all of these things that the world has to offer. And we like them too. But if we had our choice as to end this system right now versus what you have planned in the future, the answer better be let's end it now. Because if it's, oh, I want to see my grandkids. I want to, see my, I want to go to my grandkids' wedding. I want to go to my kids' wedding. You know, I want, to hold my, I want to have my first grandkid so I can be called a grandma. Those are nice things. But if Jesus, if you had the opportunity to move the kingdom of God and end this system now, would you? Would you? Any questions? Have a drink of your water. Thank you. Not really a question, but a comment, because when I think of the kingdoms of this world, I think of them as idols. And that takes me back to where in the Word there were these metal workers and so forth that were making idols out of silver and gold. And how when Jesus came around or whoever the apostle was, they, they wanted to kill that man because he was going to destroy their livelihood. And I perceive that same thing as truth when we talk about our kingdoms needing to be changed. Many of us have set that kingdom up as an idol and really don't want it to change mm -hmm. because we believe that we will lose everything that it has provided. Well, see, again, not wanting to end this system, again, goes back to not trusting God. See, I trust that God has... <laughs> this is going to be real elementary, but I trust that God has a better system than the one that's going on right now. But we're so afraid to lose our own lives and give up the things we like because we've got this idea that we're going to sing, we're going to be sit sitting in a pew in, in heaven or on the new earth and singing for 10,000 years. That doesn't appeal to people much right now. You can hardly get them to sing, to stand and sing a hymn. So when you preach about heaven and you, pre and you read what's in heaven about the elders falling down and people just saying glory, hallelujah to the Lamb, they get this picture, that ain't going to be real fun. So I don't really want this kingdom to come until I'm done with my fun here on the earth. That's, I'm just giving you a real basic rundown. I want my fun here on the earth. Then after I'm old and I don't care anymore, then I can sit in a pew and sing for 10,000 years. But see, I trust that when God says his kingdom is better, there must be something that's more fun in the spirit that's going to go in this new system than what we're experiencing in the soul in the old system. And you know, we bring a little bit of that into our church services. Because I get the impression that with most of us, we're not begrudgingly being here. I think a lot of people are having a good time while they're here. And just think, we're, just, we're experiencing it, we're experiencing it, we're experiencing it on a low, low level because of where we're at in, in our... In, being humanistic. Imagine what it would be life it, like if it was in this perfect system. See, once you've tasted it here in the human realm, then you start looking forward to the, new, to the new earth and the new heaven because you've experienced some joy here. But what do most people experience in their church services? That's what they think it's going to be. And so they're going to fight against it because they have fun out there in the world, but they hate their church services. And they think, I don't want to do this for the all eternity until I'm done with 
and I've lived as long as I can here on the earth and had as much fun as I can and done as much as I can. I don't want to do that yet. <clears throat> so many people think that fun is, you know, that's what they don't want to give up. And anybody that has any sense at all knows that God created everything in the first place. And he did a beautiful job. That's what they don't want to give up is the things that are here on this earth, the things that are beautiful, that they want, like you say, they want to travel, they want to have fun. But their idea of fun is destructive. I mean, they go out and they get drunk and they puke all over the place. And there's nothing fun about that, but they think that's going to be fun. And it, do they really want to do that for eternity, you know? But my, my vision is that you know, if this is so beautiful and we haven't even scratched the surface of all the beautiful things that God's created now, ha if he's bringing something new, it has to be <laughs> beyond what any man can think of. He mm -hmm. says, all eyes have not heard or seen and ears have not heard and you can't even imagine what I've got. And so I want to see what's better than what I think is the most gorgeous thing in the world because it's, it's going to be so much greater. And that fun that people are, that is killing people, you know, their eyes are going to be open to see that wasn't fun at all. That was, that was death. And I don't see anything neat about being six foot under mm -hmm. <laughs> and not being able ever to do anything to me, that is, it's only common sense that if God created this, how, what better thing is he going to create for the new earth? Sure. Everything you see now is in a fallen state. And, uh, you know, I talked with a man one time a long time ago, just about the time, just before I got involved here in the, in the full gospel movement. And when you talk to people privately, they talk different than when they're in their church group. And you talk to him privately, and he told me, he said, I don't want Jesus to come back. And he told me all these things he wanted to do and experience before Jesus came back. And he said he didn't want him to come back yet. Even though we sang the song in the church service, Oh, what a wonderful day it will be. Jesus is coming again. Nobody really wanted him to come back because they wanted to experience life. And as long as you have the love of the world, we're going to continually be dealing with the consequences. And I, I think I, I didn't say the fullness of what I wanted to say is that when new people come in, yes, they have the love of the world. But I'm talking about most of the people that are going forward in the prayer lines today have been in this for years and years and years. And they're still trying to just deal with the consequences of their love of the world. You know, I understand when people first come in here. And they're going to have that. And I, I'm certainly not going to, you know, and God will deal with consequences. And sometimes he will in our lives too. But remember, there's a responsibility when he deals with that consequence. And if you spend it on your pleasures, you, I think you're going to be in trouble. Worse consequences are going to come upon you. Not, wait a minute. Not because God puts them on you, but because you now become even more responsible and now the devil has more reign in your life oh, yeah. if you don't yield to the responsibility of those consequences being taken out of your life. I was thinking about the scripture. You said that God gives us all things richly to enjoy. Mm -hmm. The one thing that God does for us is he changes the things that we enjoy. Right. Right. You know, the, uh, the, the things that we wanted before we came into this, are so, are, um, they're totally opposite. A lot of those things are opposite of what we want now in our life. And, and, you know, you talk about the people not wanting to give up the things of the world, but what they don't realize is as you start looking to God, those things don't matter anymore, and he puts new things in place of those for you to enjoy. The, the things that, that you want change, and, and eventually your focus goes even off of those things, and you begin to look more at him. So if they, it's really sad that they can't take those, the, the word of God in the truth that he meant it, because the enemy has deceived us so much as to what is joy, what is enjoyable. Mm -hmm. and, and then when you do find out that God has so much more to offer than what the enemy does, 
then you look at all those things that people are doing and you're wondering, just like she was saying with the drinking, I used to think that was a very enjoyable thing to do. But now the thought of doing those things, it's, it's repulsive to me to mm -hmm. go out and do the things that I did then. Mm -hmm. So he changes those desires in us so that that's not where we go anymore. Mm -hmm. So then we can have those things to enjoy because they're becoming more of his desires instead of, instead of the old worldly desires. I think it's interesting that, you know, if, if you think about how God changes our desires, he takes uh, the desires we had that we used for the devil and he changes them into desires for himself. But it's still the same desire. In other words, you drank alcohol, now you drank him. See what I mean? You get drunk on him now instead of being drunk with alcohol. See, and he, he, that's how he changes. He destroyed the one, but it, it still exists. It's just now become his kingdom. Yeah. See, it's now the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Yeah. Yeah. You see, so anything that he takes, and that's why we have such different giftings, you know, in our body is um, he takes those things that we're all different in and he changes them for his kingdom and I, and I can't you know look at each and every person here and and tell you what it is that you had for the world that's now been changed but um, you know I was always a uh, you know a, a, a loner a, 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 a thinker um, and I was always alone you always wanted to be alone I didn't like people well he changed that in me to where you know, and I was always afraid of speaking, right? I mean, I couldn't speak in front of people. I mean, just to get up and say my name terrified me, you know, to have people looking at me. And he took that, and now he's changed it and made it into a speaking for people. See, a not speaking into speaking. So that's what he does. And so I, I can look at each person in here, and I can see where, where God try, was trying to take some things in your the way that you think and the, your personality things and change them for what you once used for the world, and now change it using it for him. And that's how he destroys the kingdoms of the... That's how that rock destroys all of the kingdoms, but it destroys them by making them a kingdom of his Lord and of his Christ. That's how he does it. And you've got to keep that... you always got to keep that in mind when you read the Old Testament, as we read it so much with a humanistic concept, so when we read through the prophets and... He's going to destroy this people and he's going to destroy those people and judgment on this and judgment on that. It's to change them. It's to change them. It's not to kill them. It's to change them. It's always been that way. It's to change. Huh? No, we just read that. He said it's not willing that any should perish. And he's trying to bring all to repentance. <laughs> I'm going to say this. He's trying to kill everybody. <laughs> I know that's going to get, they just can't, that, it's going to be, it's going to be hard for them to get. But that's how God, that, that by making them new. He kills them and he makes them new. And therefore the old is gone. Like I said, old things have passed away. Everything's become new. So the old, it says, your old man, what does it say in the scripture? Your old man is dead, or, or he, your old man died, or, you know what, the old man, what? It says something about the old man is dead, you know, or something like that. Well, that's what he's talking about. He dies, and you get new. So we want to be killed by God. We don't want to be killed by the devil. Sorry. That's the way it is. <laughs> See, I was thinking of something else, too, but I, I just can't remember it now. Um, yeah, doesn't matter. Maybe next week. <laughs> Anybody else? You have anything to add, Kathy? Did I forget anything? Well, I know we did, we discussed some things a couple of days ago, and we were going over. Yeah, I know she has a hard time remembering 
some of those things. But I keep thinking about that where um, he began to show me when all the nations within us begin to bow down and they begin to claim him as king of kings, you know, and where those fear, where fear used to be, it's now honoring him and where that anger is, you know, it's turned around for anger of, of the things of the world. And, yeah. you know, so it's just, like you said, it's awesome when those kingdoms become his kingdoms, you know, of the world. And, and that's how he does that, you know, because I really believe that all of that was set up at first for his good and his glory. And then the enemy came in and he stole the word. He stole the identity of those very things. And now we're getting them returned back to him again. How about pride? How can that be turned into the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ? What is pride? Exalting what? Exalting yourself. Now, how can that be turned? There you go. There you go. It just became the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ because now you're exalting him instead of yourself. That's how he changes it. Pride dies. And exaltation of him comes alive. It's real easy. I mean, if you, just, if you can just meditate on that and think about it, you can see how God has worked in some of your lives and some of your kingdoms have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. But we want them all, don't we? We're not satisfied with an incomplete conquest of the land. <laughs> Read Joshua. <laughs> we want a complete conquest. Amen? Anybody else? No? Okay, Father, once again, we just thank you for your word this morning. And God, may it go forth out there on the Internet with understanding that they may understand what it is that we're saying here. And not just what we're saying, but God, they search it out in the word and find it where it's been said many, many times. That once we accept what it is that we preach or what we believe, we see it everywhere in Scripture. So God, open their eyes as they read their Bible, as we read our Bible, open up our eyes that we may see even greater things that you have for us. And God, show us how to speed and end this present age, that we want the return. We want everything restored, like it says in the book of Acts, that the heavens must contain Jesus until the restoration of all things spoken of by the prophets. So God, show us how to restore these things because you work through your people. And God, that we may end this present age. Seal this up in our hearts. and God, cause us to, to walk more and more in annihilating this culture and bringing your culture in. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.